Number 1. It all began on the quiet afternoon of December 23, 1988, in Greensboro, North Carolina. 19-year-old Ken Dungy was picked up by three of his friends en route to do some last-minute Christmas shopping. The four young African-American men planned to make the hour and a half trip to Raleigh on the I-40 highway. It had been a good year for all of them. The driver, 17-year-old Laverne Allen, had just received a scholarship to the Air Force Academy. Ken Dungy was a drafting and engineering student, headed for college in the fall. 17-year-old Kenneth Newkirk had just received a scholarship to a local college. And 17-year-old Darius Bannerman was a high school basketball star with a promising future. On their way to the shopping mall, the four passed a car driven by a man named Grady Alexander. When they went by me, they were doing about 60, 65. I looked over, and one of the boys saw me looking at him, he grinned and waved, and the car kept on going. After that, another car came up on me very fast. And as it got by me, I happened to look down at the license plate, and I said to myself, a redneck from Georgia. Because his hair looked like it was dirty and greasy and stringy. And he was probably doing 75 or 80. A few moments later, Laverne Allen noticed a blue Monte Carlo closing in at a high rate of speed. When I looked in the rear view mirror, I saw a car and he was so close to me, I could not see his front bumper. That's how close he was. At first I just thought it was somebody tailgating, just riding close. Still weary from an earlier basketball practice, Darius Bannerman was napping in the front seat when he was suddenly woken up. I was sleeping and everyone in there was talking about this guy that's following us. At first, I didn't think anything of it, but, the guy was extremely close to the point where, you know, it was like right on our bumper. He bumped us, and it didn't seem as though this was all happening it was like, horror. Traffic was moving fast and we speeded up to get away from the guy. The man driving the Monte Carlo, he had a look like we had done something personal to him, like mad. It just looked like he wanted to hurt us. Then, without warning, the Monte Carlo pulled alongside the boy's car and rammed it off the highway. A few minutes later, police and paramedics arrived at the accident site. They found a horrific scene. Laverne Allen was trapped in the car for half an hour. After being airlifted to a trauma center, his leg was amputated at the thigh. Ken Newkirk had suffered a fractured skull and a broken leg. Darius Bannerman had a broken wrist and facial injuries. Ken Dungy was pronounced dead at the scene. Beth Veliket was the first reporter on the scene and spoke with several witnesses who described the assault. The eyewitnesses said that after the car went off the road, the Monte Carlo did pull over to the side. A man and a woman got out, just for a moment, and looked back, and then drove off. Because of a lack of evidence, the police were reluctant to treat the incident as a crime. However, the victims believed that it was a murder. The driver of the Monte Carlo had a mustache and brown stringy hair. He was traveling with a woman who had blonde hair. The wanted vehicle is described as a light blue Monte Carlo, with Georgia license plates. The case was featured on Unsolved Mysteries and is still talked about on internet forums, but seems unlikely to ever be solved. Number 2 Wednesday, March 13 marked 53 years since South African Airways Flight 406 plummeted into the sea in 1967 on its approach to East London, killing all 25 people on board. What caused the Rietbach Air disaster remains a mystery and continues to trouble the surviving relatives of the doomed passengers. The failure to recover the victims' bodies and the presence of two high-profile figures on board has fueled speculation about a nefarious cover-up by the apartheid government. The official inquiry, headed by Judge Cecil Margot, suggested the captain, Gordon Benjamin Leposky, might have suffered a heart attack, resulting in him losing control of the Viscount, and that his first officer, Brian Trenwith, was unable to regain control before the Rietbach crashed into the sea. However, in his book Final Postponement, Margot pointed to structural failure as the reason for the crash. Margot died in 2000. Navy diver Malcolm Viviers in 1998 suggested the wreck had in fact been located soon after the crash and claimed that via a video monitor on the SAS Johannesburg, he had seen the bodies of passengers still strapped in their seats in the plane. Dr. David Klatso, an imminent Cape Town-based independent forensic scientist who pointed out flaws in the investigation of the 1987 Helderberg air disaster, was approached about 15 years ago by some relatives of victims of the Rietbach disaster. Klatso said they had told him they had been called to the state mortuary to identify the bodies after the crash. However, when they arrived at the mortuary, no bodies were to be found. But I was also shown a post-mortem report showing one of the family members had died of multiple injuries, Klatso said. 
so there was a post-mortem report without a body. He said there was no question that the investigation into the Reekbach crash had been a sham and that Margot was notorious for having covered up for the apartheid regime. I called him a crook, even when he was still alive, Klatso said. J.P. Brower, at the time the vice rector of the then University of Port Elizabeth and acting chair of the Broderbund, was on board the doomed plane. Brower's eldest daughter, Griot LaRue, 75, told the dispatch about the aftermath of the crash. My brother and his wife got a phone call on the night of the crash. At the time they were living in Peketburg in the Western Cape. The mortuary asked them to drive to East London to identify the bodies, she said. So they drove to East London, but when they got there, the people at the mortuary told them there had been a mistake and there were no bodies. We found out later that somebody else had booked his flight from Port Elizabeth to the official inquiry suggested the captain, Gordon Benjamin Leposky, might have suffered a heart attack East London. We don't know who LaRue said. In 1998, families of victims approached the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, asking for the government to reopen the case, but were denied. This was the first time LaRue had the opportunity to meet members of other victims' families. There was one lady who told us how she had also been called by the mortuary workers, who even described the dress her daughter was wearing and the ring on her finger. But again, when they got to the morgue, there were no bodies. LaRue claims her father was targeted because he had the ear of the then leader of apartheid South Africa, Hendrik Verward, and was trying to persuade him to soften apartheid policies. My father wrote the speech Verward was due to deliver before he was assassinated. We think Verward was killed to stop him making the speech. My aunt told me that after my father attended Verward's memorial service, he told her, I'm the next one. Ian Boyd, a commercial pilot, is the son of the late James Boyd, who at the time of the crash, was a pilot for SA. On Tuesday, March 14, 1967, James Boyd and fellow crew members arrived in East London from Johannesburg as part of the salvage operations. According to Boyd, his father said the wreckage was about 130 feet below, easily accessible to divers. On the Friday of that week he was found dead in his hotel room at 7 in the morning. Boyd's mother was told he had died of a heart attack. My father was 51 years old. He was healthy he was a springbok golfer. There was no post-mortem and we were never shown the body. Before he died, my father phoned my mother to tell her that he thought there were shady things going on. Although his father died in East London, the death certificate was signed in Benoni. There was minimal wreckage to work with for the subsequent investigation into the crash and no bodies were ever recovered. Theories ranged from the pilot suffering a heart attack to sabotage. Others believed the plane crashed due to structural failure as the wing may have separated from the body of the aircraft. However, the true cause of the crash has never been established. Number 3 Although only 13 years old, David Guerrero Guevara was already a particularly skilled painter. He lived in Malaga, Spain with his parents and two brothers. David was a shy and introverted boy, he didn't like going outside and only ever went to school in his art academy. According to his mother Antonia, David had no friends, didn't like going to places alone, and always rode the bus with his brother to the academy. On April 3, 1987, David took part in a religious art exhibition at the prestigious La Maison Art Gallery. David's painting, a portrait of Jesus entitled Christ of the Good Death, attracted a good amount of publicity because of his young age. On April 6, David was scheduled to meet a local radio host for an interview at La Maison after he got out of school. David was very nervous about the interview and, according to a classmate, complained about having stomach pain and a headache. At 6 p.m., David came home from school, changed his clothes, and left for his interview a half hour later. David's father Jose originally planned to drive him to the gallery, but something came up at his job and David was forced to take the bus by himself instead. After the interview was over, David would go to his art academy and then get picked up by his dad. He left home that evening carrying his bus card and a bag of art supplies. Three hours later, at 9 p.m., Jose arrived at the art academy to take David home. David wasn't at the academy, however, and Jose discovered at La Maison that his son never showed up for the interview. When Jose found that David wasn't at home either, he drove to the police station and reported his son missing. The police found David's disappearance baffling. The bus station was only 10 to 15 minutes away from his house, yet none of the bus drivers in the area picked him up. Queen Sophia, the wife of the then-current Spanish king, was also in Malaga that day for a special visit, so there were tons of people on the street during the time. Yet nobody reported seeing David at the bus station, and the authorities were skeptical that a stranger could have forced the boy into a car unnoticed. 
So where did the boy artist as the media nicknamed him go? The police wondered if he might have run away from home, but David's family was very skeptical of the idea. After all, David was very close to his family and he had little connections outside of it. Still, investigators pursed the runaway theory, speculating that David might have left for Portugal to become a bohemian artist. Eventually, a pair of Spanish policemen who searched in Lisbon found no trace of David there. Although there were some sightings of David in the country, including by a pair of Spanish teachers, the police believed the eyewitnesses were mistaken. Number 4 in 2006, Robert Eric Wohn was a 32-year-old Washington, D.C. lawyer living in suburban Oakton, Virginia working general counsel at Radio Free Asia in downtown Washington, D.C. He had to work late on the night of August 2, 2006, and instead of making the long commute home, he opted to spend the night at the home of his college friend, Joseph Price, a D.C. resident and prominent attorney, who lived with his domestic partner Victor Zaborski and their lover Dylan Ward. Later that evening, Wone, who was straight, was found stabbed to death in the home's guest bedroom. Due to Price's high-profile job and the nature of the three men's sexual relationship, the story garnered a lot of attention. After a 911 call, the police arrived and Price, who worked at D.C. law firm Arendt Fox in 1998, and had met Wone while attending the College of William and Mary in Virginia, and the other men told police they thought an intruder killed Wone after entering the house through an unlocked back door while they were asleep in their respective bedrooms. However, homicide detectives and prosecutors disputed the men's claim, saying forensic evidence showed Wone appeared to have been immobilized by a paralytic drug and sexually assaulted before he was stabbed three times in the chest and abdomen. The detectives also noted there was no signs of a struggle. Despite the inconsistencies, no one was arrested. Three months after Wone's death, Joseph Price's brother and an accomplice broke into the Swan Street residence and took more than $7,000 of electronic equipment. The two were charged with the burglary, but the charges were later dropped. In 2007, D.C. police revealed that they had been planning to make an arrest in the Wone murder case when the burglary derailed those plans. Authorities never revealed whom the intended target was or what that person would have been charged with. In August 2007, Eric Wones' widow Catherine Wones expressed her frustration with the FBI crime lab, it has been trying at times, as we continue to wait for the FBI to complete their analysis of all the samples that were taken, reported the Washington Post. On August 2, 2007, the one-year anniversary of Wones' death, there was a press conference in which Eric Holder, a lawyer who went on to serve as the 82nd Attorney General of the United States from 2009 to 2015, publicly asked the three men to provide additional information to the authorities, saying you need to ask yourself, have I provided police with all the information I know? In October 2008, an obstruction of justice charge was filed against housemate Dylan Ward. In November 2008, Price and Zaborski were arrested and also charged with obstruction of justice. Price was represented by Bernard Grimm from Cozen O'Connor. Dylan Ward was represented by David Schertler from Schertler and Honorado. Victor Zaborski was represented by Thomas Connolly from Harris Wiltshire and Granis and has been recognized as one of the best lawyers in America. All three men were later released on bond pending trial but were subject to electronic monitoring and curfews. Additional charges of conspiracy were filed against all three men on December 19, 2008. The affidavit filed by authorities showed that investigators had concluded the men were lying about the so-called intruder and that the evidence demonstrates that Robert Wone was restrained, incapacitated, sexually assaulted, and murdered inside 1509 Swan Street, and there exists overwhelming evidence, far in excess of probable cause, that the men obstructed justice by altering and orchestrating the crime scene, planting evidence, delaying the reporting of the murder to the authorities, and lying to the police about the true circumstances of the murder. Lawyers for the men maintained their client's innocence and called the affidavit speculation, innuendo, assumptions, and irrelevant inflammatory comments. Officials believed that a kitchen knife had been smeared with blood and put next to the body, and that cadaver dogs found a blood residue in a dryer lint trap and the patio drain, which detectives believe may be evidence that someone washed themselves in the back patio area and dried wet clothes in the dryer. The men's formal defense in the conspiracy case began on June 17, 2010. None of the defendants testified. On June 29, 2010, D.C. Superior Court Judge Lynn Leibovitz found each of the three men not guilty of charges of conspiracy, obstruction of justice and tampering with evidence. 
Following the sensational trial, which was covered extensively in the D.C. metropolitan area press, Leibovitz said the prosecutors proved that the murder was not committed by a so-called intruder, but that the D.C. prosecutors had failed to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the three men engaged in evidence tampering or obstruction of justice. In August 2011, Price, Zaborski and Ward agreed to an out-of-court settlement with Wohn's wife after she filed a $20 million wrongful death lawsuit against them the previous year, charging them with being responsible for her husband's death. Washington, D.C. civil attorneys for the widow said the settlement involved a monetary payment from the three men, but the amount of the settlement was never disclosed. Wohn's death been one of Washington, D.C.'s most mysterious homicide cases. Number 5. On May 25, 2003 at Quattro de Ferreiro International Airport in Angol, shortly before sunset on a clear day, Ben Charles Padilla was seen boarding a Boeing 727 that he had previously been hired to work on. The Boeing had been manufactured in 1975 and had formerly been owned by American Airlines. Its owner in May 2003 was Miami-based company Aerospace Sales and Leasing, and the aircraft carried tail number N844AA. The Miami company had leased the plane to Tagangola Airlines. N-844AA had been grounded and sat idle at Luanda Airport for 14 months, accruing more than $4 million in backdated airport fees. The plane was one of two at Quattro de Ferreiro Airport, in the process of being converted for use by IRS Airlines. The FBI files described the plane as unpainted silver in color with a stripe of blue, white, and blue. The plane was formerly in the air fleet of a major airline, but all of the passenger seats have been removed. It is outfitted to carry diesel fuel. Also seen boarding the plane that evening with Padilla was a helper he had recently hired, John Mikkel Mutantu, from the Republic of the Congo. The two had been working with Angolan mechanics to return the 727 to flight-ready status, but neither could fly it. Mutantu was not a pilot, and Padilla had only a private pilot's license. According to press reports, shortly after the me had been seen to board the plane, the aircraft began unauthorized taxiing. No communication was made between the unknown crew and the tower, the plane was seen maneuvering erratically, it then entered onto a runway without clearance. With its lights off and its transponder not transmitting, an 844AA took off to the southwest and headed out over the Atlantic Ocean. The tower continued to try to make contact, but there was no response, and the tracking transponder remained turned off. A short time later air traffic control lost sight of the aircraft. It should be noted that a Boeing 727 ordinarily requires three trained aircrew, and it is claimed it is almost impossible to fly with a crew of just two. According to later reports, the Boeing 727 Flight Monwell does have emergency flying procedures to enable a crew of two to fly the plane. The Boeing 727 and the two men have not been seen since. As this was just following 9-11's U.S. investigators spent months searching for the plane. The FBI at first concluded that the Boeing 727 that had just mysteriously disappeared had likely crashed. No evidence of this was or has ever been discovered, however. The FBI then suggested the plane had been flown to a remote hangar to be stripped for parts. CIA intelligence officials also expressed fears that the 153-foot, 200,000-pound aircraft might have been stolen by terrorists for use as a weapon against Western targets in Africa. But an examination of satellite photographs and visits to dozens of African airfields failed to yield any evidence that it is on the continent, leading U.S. officials to largely discount the terrorism scenario. A number of theories and possible explanations for the mystery have been reported since it disappeared, these include sightings in July 2003, a possible sighting of the missing plane was reported in Conakry, Guinea. In August 2003, a reported sighting of the plane on an airfield at Kankan Airport, Guinea. Another theory is that the 727's owners decided to make the aircraft disappear to collect the insurance money. It has been documented that the plane was in a terrible state and the insurance overvalued the plane. But if that's case, then what happened to Padilla and his assistant? Reports leaked as part of the United States diplomatic cables leak indicate that the United States searched for the aircraft in multiple countries after the event. A regional security officer searched for it in Sri Lanka without result. A ground search was also conducted by diplomats stationed in Nigeria at multiple airports without finding it. The telegram from Nigeria also states that the diplomats did not consider likely a landing of the 727 at a major airport, since the aircraft could have been easily identified. Number 6 
a Hawaii man was arrested and charged in connection with a North Salt Lake cyberstalking case. According to court documents, the man sent over 500 unwanted service workers to a Utah family's home. Lauren Akamura, 44, was arrested on Friday and taken into custody in Hawaii. The Honolulu man is facing two counts of cyberstalking, one count of interstate threats, and two counts of transportation of an individual to engage in prostitution, according to a federal indictment. From Honolulu, investigators believe Akamura used technology and spoofed phone numbers from remote locations to send unwanted visitors to Walt Gilmore's home in North Salt Lake. The indictment states that the extensive and repeated threats, along with sending workers to the home, began in 2018 and continued through August 2019. Those service providers that were duped into victimizing this family lost thousands of dollars in the process of being called out on phony, bogus calls John Huber, U.S. attorney for Utah, told reporters during a press conference Tuesday afternoon. A Utah family was tormented with hundreds of incidents in the course of conduct that really changed their life and even their whole neighborhood. You'd get all kinds of people. You'd get workers who had small companies, like landscape artists, people delivering water, delivering food. We had some sad cases where people who had lost pets would come expecting to see their pet here because we were told the Gilmores had their pets and we would have to tell them it was a scam, explained Gary Levitt. He lives next door to the Gilmores. You heard stories about people who were also looking for drug deals and prostitutes. And the people would come into the backyards and try and see into the windows of the Gilmores. And of course, you're wondering, okay, are people doing the same thing to our homes? Akamura is also accused of sending an email to Gilmore's adult daughter, saying she should sleep with one eye open and keep looking over her shoulder, according to court documents. The documents go on to say Akamura encouraged the woman to kill herself. This was not random, said Huber. You will find in stalking dynamics that more often than not, in fact, a majority of cases, stalkers fixate on someone they've had an intimate relationship with, and those dynamics are present in this case. Gilmore and his daughter filed a stalking injunction against Akamura, but say he continued to stalk the family. When a stalker fixates on a victim, it's almost like they lose control of their faculties, Huber explained. Huber said he believes this is Utah's first federal cyberstalking case, but thinks more of these crimes will come to light in the future. It took law enforcement officials a long time to find Akamura because he doesn't have a permanent address or job in Hawaii. Huber also noted that Akamura is very tech-savvy and used apps to falsify his location. On Friday, members of Utah's FBI cyber team flew to Hawaii, found Akamura in 15 hours and arrested him. Akamura's next court appearance is scheduled for Wednesday, where the magistrate judge will make the decision of whether or not to detain the defendant. Number 7 on the morning of September 11, 2001, New York City fell victim to a series of four terrorist attacks by the hands of an Islamic terrorist group called Al-Qaeda. Over 2,996 people died and over 6,000 were injured. There are still over 1,000 people that have not been identified by the medical examiner. Another mystery still remains though did Dr. Sneha Philip perish in the attack or did she use the tragedy to start her life over? Sneha Ann Philip was a 31-year-old physician. She was working hard at completing her residency in internal medicine. She was married to Dr. Ron Lieberman, and the two had an apartment in Battery Park, just a short walk away from the World Trade Center. Sneha was last seen on September 10, 2001. She had the day off work and was planning on getting her apartment cleaned up for a dinner with her cousin in a couple of days. She spent two hours having a chat with her mother online, mentioning that she had planned to go visit the windows on the World Restaurant in the North Tower of the World Trade Center. After the chat, she left her apartment to head to the dry cleaners. She then went to a Century 21 where she was caught on camera using her credit card to buy lingerie, a dress, pantyhose, and bed sheets. She then purchased three pairs of shoes at a nearby store. The purchases were around 7.18 p.m. and were totaled at $550. This security footage from Century 21 is the last known movement by Sneha. She will never be seen again. Ron came home to the apartment around midnight and noticed that his wife was not there. She had a history of staying out late or all night with her brother, so he went to bed. Police discovered that at 4 a.m. he received a phone call on his cell phone and checked his voicemail, although he claims he doesn't remember doing so. He awoke at 6.30 a.m. for work and noticed that Sneha had not contacted him and still had not returned home. Just before the first plane hit in the attack on September 11, a woman was seen on Sneha and Ron's apartment building's security footage. 
The brunette woman walked towards the elevator, paused for a second, then exited the building. She was dressed like Sneha and moved like Sneha, but because of the early morning sun it was never confirmed to be her, though Ron swears it was his missing wife. After the attack, he was able to return home to his apartment. The window was left open and dust had settled on the ground. The only tracks in the dust were from their kittens. Sneha had not returned to the apartment. There have been no sightings of Sneha since before the attack. Her family and investigators believe that after the attack, she must have run to the site to help since she had a medical background. She was listed as victim number 2750 of the terrorist attacks for two years before her name was removed from the list. During the investigation into her disappearance it was discovered by the New York police that Sneha had recently been let go by the hospital. She then got arrested, apparently pursued relationships with other women from bars, and was charged with a misdemeanor related to falsely reporting an incident of sexual abuse. The morning of September 10 she was formally arraigned, and there are reports of her fighting loudly with Ron in the lobby of the courthouse. Sneha's family firmly denies these accusations, claiming that she was fired due to reporting racial and sexual bias at the hospital. They claim she had no alcoholism issues and just frequented gay bars to avoid being put in another sexual assault situation. Ron says they never fought at the courthouse and that the police were exaggerating their reports. After Sneha's name was removed from the 9-11's victims list, her family took the matter to the courts. After losing and appealing, they finally successfully got her added back to the list of victims. There are still a lot of people out there who also believe she died in the attacks. Maybe she was helping with the injured? Maybe she was in the windows on the World Restaurant? Maybe she just was in the wrong place at the wrong time like so many of the innocent lives lost that day? But there are a lot of people who believe she used the moment to start her life over. A postcard was submitted to the anonymous website, postsecret.com, that simply says everyone who knew me before 9-11s believes I'm dead. Many assume this was sent in by Sneha, but there has never been any confirmation. Despite the number of people that are still unidentified from the attacks, Sneha's family is hopeful that her remains will be found. They believe that she was wearing a specific piece of jewelry that would have survived the attacks, a pretty diamond menu, a traditional Malayali Christian wedding pendant, shaped like a gold teardrop with a diamond set in it. Her family believes this pendant is still among the items that have been unclaimed. Number 8 the Hamilton County coroner examining Otto Warmier found he had a collection of small scars on his body, but none appear serious enough to indicate he was tortured while he was imprisoned in North Korea. The coroner's report, which the Inquirer obtained Tuesday, only deepened the mystery of what happened to the 22-year-old University of Virginia student, who died six days after he returned June 13 to Cincinnati from more than a year in North Korean custody. Warmier's parents, Fred and Cindy Warmier of suburban Wyoming, appeared on national television Tuesday morning and broke their three months of silence over the death of their son. Cindy Warmier said. They destroyed him. Fred Warmier accused North Korean officials of torturing their child to the point that it looked like someone had taken a pair of pliers and rearranged his bottom teeth. After the Warmier's morning appearance on Fox News, President Trump took to Twitter to observe, great interview on at Fox and Friends with the parents of Otto Warmier. 1994, 2017. Otto was tortured beyond belief by North Korea. But the coroner's post-mortem examination of Otto Warmier did not indicate the young man's teeth had been disfigured. The teeth are natural and in good repair, the report said, and his nose and ears show no remarkable alteration. The inquirer left a message with Fred Warmier Tuesday in an effort to reconcile the parents' comments with the coroner's report. The Warmier's television appearances that later appeared on CNN as well, and the president's Twitter comment occurred at a tense geopolitical moment. Relations between the United States and North Korea have hit their lowest point in more than half a century. The reclusive Asian state has been test-firing missiles capable of carrying a nuclear warhead, and Trump has promised that the United States is prepared to retaliate against any threat. Deputy County Coroner Dr. Gretel Stevens, with oversight by the elected coroner, Dr. Lakshmi Samarko, conducted the examination and wrote the report. The cause of death, the report noted, was brain damage from a lack of oxygen due to an unknown insult more than a year prior to death, insult, in this case, meaning an injury. The coroner limited the investigation to examining Otto Warmier's body because his parents declined an autopsy. The coroner's report of the young man's well-developed, well-nourished body lists at least small 10 scars. At least half of them were pale, indicating they were older. Newer scars with bruising, such as one on his right side of his neck, could have come from medical treatment, such as for an intravenous line. 
Another at the top of Warmere's sternum is consistent with a tracheostomy scar made to insert a breathing tube, although when that could have happened is not clear in the report. Dr. Brian Peterson, coroner of Milwaukee County, Wisconsin, is president of the National Association of Medical Examiners. He reviewed the Warmere report at the inquirer's request to clarify terminology, and he stressed he was not speaking directly about the case. Some of the older scars look like something an athletic boy might acquire as part of growing up, he said. Hypothetically, could these things happen if you're in a rough prison in North Korea? That might explain some of these things, but there's nothing specific to show that, he said. In June, after Warmere was released from North Korea and flown back to Cincinnati, he was taken to University of Cincinnati Medical Center where doctors ran tests. Days later at a news conference, the doctors reported that they found no broken bones or other signs of trauma. But the brain damage was extensive and severe. An experienced globetrotter, Otto Warmere went to North Korea with Young Pioneer Tours, a company based in China. He was arrested January 2, 2016, in the capital of Pyongyang and accused of stealing a poster from a hotel. He was convicted and sentenced to 15 years at hard labor. Nothing more was heard from Warmere for 15 months. Three months ago, the North Korean government released him with a statement that Warmere had contracted botulism, taken a sleeping pill and fell into a coma. The UC doctors used a newer term to describe his condition. A state of unresponsive wakefulness when the brain is starved of oxygen. The UC doctors said they found no botulism in Warmere's body. But even if the botulism explanation is true, the toxin cannot live in the body for a year. Treating botulism requires an antitoxin, not a sleeping pill. The UC doctors also reported that a computer disk accompanied Warmere from North Korea and contained a set of medical records, including scans from April and June 2016, that revealed his brain shrinking. In June, Samarco deferred ruling on the cause of Warmere's death to investigate further. Stevens signed the examination report September 11. After Warmere's funeral, North Korea denied torturing him and proclaimed puzzlement at his swift death after his return home. Although we had no reason of all to show mercy to such a criminal of the enemy state, we provided him with medical treatments and care with all sincerity on a humanitarian basis until his return to the U.S. Number 9. Kershich was an assistant editor for Frommer's Travel Guides in New York City, New York, and resided in the borough of Queens. She was chosen to participate in a travel junket to the New Sandals Resort in Havana, Cuba on May 24, 2000. Kershich flew to Montego Bay, Jamaica, with three other travel journalists on that day. The group was then scheduled to fly to Havana, but then they learned they would not be allowed entry into Cuba. All flights back to New York were booked through June 1, and Kershich was rerouted to the Sandals Beaches Resort in Negril, Jamaica, with another travel writer, Tania Grossinger, on May 25. Grossinger told authorities that Kershich became friends with one of the resort's bartenders, Anthony Grant, during their stay. Grossinger was able to arrange a last-minute flight out of Negril to New York during the morning of May 27, 2000. She and Kershich met for breakfast prior to Grossinger's departure. Kershich planned to stay at the resort until more flights to the United States became available. She was last seen by a Sandals Beaches resort lifeguard as she walked along the beach later that afternoon. She has never been heard from again. Kershich's parents became concerned when they failed to contact their daughter by June 2. They called Frommer's Travel Guide's offices in New York City and learned that she never returned to work. An investigation was initiated in Negril, and all of Kershich's personal belongings were discovered in her hotel room. The only items missing were her bikini, t-shirt and radio, the same possessions she was seen wearing on the beach on May 27. Her passport, return plane ticket, $180 cash, credit and ATM cards, camera, cellular phone and clothing were located in her room. Kershich's belongings were reportedly taken to the Sandals Beaches resort manager's office, and her hotel room was rented out to other guests, possibly contaminating a potential crime scene. Her cellular phone disappeared shortly thereafter, as did the logbook that recorded all vehicles' license plate numbers that entered and exited the resort. A security camera videotape near Kershich's hotel room was inadvertently recorded over after her disappearance as well. The resort developed the film in her camera after her disappearance, but reported that there were no photos on it. Authorities learned that Grant called in sick on May 28, the day after Kershich was last seen. He remained out of work for four days. The FBI began its own investigation along with Negril authorities and discovered a strand of Kershich's hair in the back seat of Grant's white Toyota Corolla. 
A search dog traced her scent to the trunk of the car, as well as a pair of Grant's boots and gloves at his residence. DNA testing conducted on the items proved to be inconclusive. A small amount of blood was discovered on the blade of a knife inside Grant's home, but it was too small to merit additional analysis. Grant agreed to a polygraph test after Kershich disappeared, but the results were also inconclusive. Authorities do not consider him a suspect in her case, but her parents believe that he may know what happened to their daughter. The Jamaican press portrayed Kershich as an adventure seeker who was probably responsible for her own fate after her disappearance in 2000. Her loved ones have stated that this description of Kershich is inaccurate and that she prepared herself before venturing to different locales. Numerous sightings of Kershich were reported in Jamaican villages after her initial disappearance, but investigators have been unable to confirm any of the reports. Kershich's family has alleged that Sandals Beach's resort employees impeded the investigation into their daughter's disappearance and that they probably know what happened to her. Her family filed a lawsuit against them for willfully destroying evidence and causing emotional stress in 2002. Many American journalists covered Kershich's case in 2000 and reported that criminal activity was occasionally widespread in Jamaica and recommended that potential visitors plan their stays accordingly. Her family said the Jamaican police did not cooperate with them and would not let them examine the investigative file. Kershich was declared legally dead in May 2002. A judge ruled that it was unlikely she disappeared of her own accord. Her case remains unsolved. Both American and Jamaican authorities are investigating. Number 10. In September 2001, the police found the torso of a young boy floating in the River Thames close to Southwark Bridge. The little body, belonging to a boy between four and seven years old, was spotted by a passerby who noticed him because of his bright orange shorts. Police named him Adam. Adam's legs, arms and head had been expertly removed with extremely sharp knives as part of a suspected West African ritual sacrifice. Poisoned and paralyzed beforehand, his body had been drained of blood and his intestines were found to contain a concoction of strange plant extracts. It would be more than 10 years before the Metropolitan Police would find out the little boy's real name and the sorry story that led to his tragic death in London. In the months after the discovery of Adam's body, forensic teams traced the plant extracts back to West Africa, most likely Nigeria. To confuse things even more, his shorts could only have been bought in Germany or Austria. Detectives traveled to West Africa to find out more about black magic, or muti, as it is called there. Muti murders are committed for the purpose of using human body parts to make medicine or bring food luck, with the body parts of children or albinos considered particularly effective. Police concluded the dark tradition of muti had happened in their own city. Several suspects were linked to the killing, with police uncovering what they believed to be a trafficking network bringing children from Africa to the UK. Although there were arrests made for trafficking, the police were none the wiser about who had committed the horrific crime. One woman, Joyce Asagiad, was arrested in Glasgow after a raid on her home led police to find a similar pair of orange shorts. She was later deported to Nigeria and never charged with the murder. In 2005, Adam was buried in an unmarked grave in Southwark Cemetery. Only those involved in the investigation were present. The case had gone cold, and for years it was believed that the Thames torso would never be identified. In 2011, an ITV journalist tracked down Joyce Asagiad in Nigeria. She was suffering from very poor mental health, but was able to reveal that she had known the little boy, whose real name was Ikpen Wosa. The little six-year-old had, she claimed, spent time living with her while she was in Germany. She had then passed the boy on to a man she called Bawa. When Joyce traveled to London a month later, she was told that Ikpen Wosa was dead. Asked if the boy in a photograph she showed the journalist was Adam, she replied yes. They used him for a ritual in the water, she said in the interview shown on ITV's London Tonight. Although it appeared to be a massive breakthrough in the case, police were reluctant to believe Joyce, who was heavily medicated at the time of the interview. And their suspicions had been right. Just one year later, Joyce gave an interview with BBC, in which she called the boy Patrick Erhuber. Her previous identification of him as Ikpen Wosa had just been a misunderstanding, she said. And the man she had passed him onto was actually Kingsley Oho, who was arrested for trafficking in 2004, but never formally linked to the murder of Adam. Adam's killer still walks free. And his origins are likely to remain a complete mystery. BBC journalists traced a boy shown in the photograph to discover he was actually Danny, now an adult in Hamburg, and the son of a former friend of Joyce's. Will O'Reilly, who led Adam's inquiry, said. 
In West Africa, there are several reasons for human sacrifices for power, money, or to protect a criminal enterprise. We believe the prime motive for the murder was to bring good fortune. We suspect Adam was killed to bring traffickers luck. While the sacrifice hardly bought any luck to the ring, it did not overly harm those at the top either. To date, no arrests in this horrific murder have been made. And even though a ritual sacrifice was suspected, this motive was never confirmed.